and I am the Public Programs, Exhibitions and Media Officer here at Mosman Art Gallery. Uh, before we get started, I first want to acknowledge the uh, traditional inhabitants of the land that we are meeting on this afternoon, including the Barogugal and Camaragal people, and acknowledge Aboriginal Elders past and present, and pay my respect to them and their heritage. So again, welcome to our audience here in the gallery, but also those of you who might be watching via Facebook Live, thank you very much for joining us on this really lovely sunny day. So thank you for coming indoors. <laughs> so this afternoon I'll be chatting with, of course, the winner of the 2020 Mosman Art Prize, Salati Tuali, and then there'll be a short opportunity afterwards for you to ask some questions. So to introduce Salati, um, so for over 15 years, Salati Tuwali has exhibited and performed nationally and internationally, most notably at the Australian Centre for Contemporary Art, the Sydney Festival, Cam uh, Camertown Art Centre, and Spring Workshop and Parasite Gallery in uh, Hong Kong. In 2017, she received the uh, inaugural Create New South Wales Visual Arts Mid Career and Established Fellowship, and, uh, and then over 2018 and 2019, she was um, uh, she entered the Australia Council uh, studio residency in London for six months and was recently appointed as the Associate Lecturer of Screen Arts at SCA at University of Sydney. So welcome Salati and congratulations once again for winning this year's major prize. Um, so to start off I thought I might um, get us to talk about your winning work which is um, Mangroves which is just over there in the corner for those who are watching from Facebook do have a look. Uh, the picture on, on social media and um, on our website. Um, so yeah, so I thought you might could begin about talking about the ideas sort of behind the work and how it sort of originated. Okay, uh, thanks Jane. I'd also like to acknowledge the traditional owners of the land on which we meet today and um, pay my respects to elders past, present and emerging. Um, and just glad to be here. Uh, <laughs> Hi everybody, <laughs> there's a handful of people sitting in front of me for those people online. Um, yeah, mangroves actually I started to make whilst in uh, lockdown and it kind of got away from me actually. It was um, going to be a more of a half-life skull kind of painting and um, I guess like uh, everyone else, lockdown's a solitary place, even if you're with your family. it's. Uh, you know, when you can't go anywhere, you kind of feel a bit uh, trapped. But so I think what happened was it, uh, the form became less of a skull. But at the time, I was just thinking about, uh, you know, our situation and considering the environment and what our future might be. And um, also, I often think about where I come from. I come from the mangroves in a place. Uh, in Rawa in Fiji and from Norgo and um, I was really thinking about how those mangroves have changed since I was um, a kid and they changed a lot due to progress they put a used to have to take a punt to get to the village and then they put a road in there and that really kind of changed the, the ecosystem so people were able to travel a lot easier but um, what changed was like the animal life and just the way that I remember it. So it's a little bit nostalgic. It's a bit of sadness and a bit of nostalgia at the same time. And I'd probably say that most of my work is situated in this idea of being diaspora. So growing up in Australia, but also being from Fiji and also having this settler colonial history here. Great. Um, yeah, so I was just going to, oh, you've sort of got onto my next point about sort of the overarching kind of concerns within your practice and, and, and you were talking about your sort of your cultural heritage and being from, you know, sort of those two um, kind of, you know, having those two sort of heritage and that sort of um, the, the conflict that that may raise. But also, um, I guess what you touched on before about, um, yeah, that uncertainty of futures and things like that, I've noticed that that sort of, um, do you think that's starting to become a, a kind of a concern, more concern of in your practice at the moment? That sort of, I, coming from things like COVID and stuff like that and being in lockdown and um, do you think that's sort of 
starting to take on more of a... Yeah, I think it's it's always been there, but I think it's everything's a bit heightened now mm. about that. But um, I guess the materiality of things that I make is decided by um, not only these heritages that I speak of, but what's available to me now. And um, I guess uh, my painting isn't stretched on canvas, it's a hanging painting and it's sort of there to mimic Mussy, or what people might know as uh, tarpa, which is this um, paper bark material used in the Pacific for a lot of things, um, for exchange, uh, because it's so useful, it was used traditionally as clothing. It also uh, is probably most recognizable as having designs on it. So, you know, it's the closest thing, I guess, to a written, language it's still very much used in um in ceremony now uh and so i kind of thought oh, i'm not going to paint on a canvas at the moment what i'm going to do is i'm going to mimic mussy i could f i could buy some and i could directly paint on it but I, I what i really wanted to do was make something that was a more like me which is sort of a hybrid of uh different cultures and so i i remake that by um getting paint and sometimes canvas and sometimes, um, gosh, what's that cotton? Uh, calico. Calico, yeah, thanks. <laughs> 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 and calico, uh, because with enough layers on that, it does start to kind of mimic that, but it's a little bit different. It also um, isn't as perfect as a canvas can be. Yeah. So there's, uh, what I have to deal with is all of the like little imperfections yeah. that exist yeah. in that. Um, I sort of want to talk about materiality and materials uh, a little bit more later on, but um, sort of before we go further, I might sort of talk about how I guess maybe people who are more familiar with your work, maybe more um, sort of you're more known for sort of say more of your video installation and kind of performance work. Um, do you think the painting has taken on a kind of a bigger role within your practice recently? Definitely over the, probably the last five years. Um, it started with, uh, I went on a residency after having lost a family member and I was trying to work out how to deal with those emotions while I was away and I started to paint. Also when you're on a residency, it's easier to roll that stuff up and put it in your case than to make um, bigger things. And I, I guess what I was trying to do was work out in the, those early paintings and drawings uh, ways to articulate um, the grief that I was feeling at the time. And so actually, because I usually make videos with myself in those videos, it was a much more abstract form. Um, and part of working out how to articulate those feelings, uh, I also kind of, I guess it was in not only the the abstract shapes that I was using, but also the, um, I guess, uh, physic sometimes physically doing something helps you uh, in your mind as well, helps yeah. you with your emotions. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And so then, I guess, those, those works started to turn up in my installations, which I'm very interested in installation because of um, the way that it encompasses our, our surroundings and, um, and so I guess uh, I just started painting more because I was painting before for myself and and then now it's become a part of the installations. <laughs> yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, did you paint much sort of earlier in your practice? Uh, I did. I Actually, I started off as a photographer and I was really interested in landscape, um, paint, uh, landscape photographs. But actually what I realized early on is what I was interested in was like walking into the landscape and sitting there. And no matter how beautiful a photograph I could make from that, it was never that same experience. Mm -hmm. I liked sitting there, having a reason to sit there, eating a sandwich, you know, <laughs> watching the light change and taking a photograph. And so, um, and then paintings were sort of more of a, um, a background thing that was done based on a feeling or to exercise an idea. In actual, in actual fact, uh, I find drawing very, uh, like, really great for my practice and great for working a lot of stuff out. Mm. So paint, for me, painting and drawing often come hand in hand. Sometimes uh, something, the feeling that I want from something I can get from adding paint to that or, yeah. you know. 
Um, and so along with that residency, you've, you've done quite a lot of kind of overseas travel, particularly in Europe in the last five years, um, with the, the, the fellowship and um, the residency in London. I guess you talked about the sort of being on that other residency and being able to work through your grief and, and also the, um, the I guess, the more accessibility of, of painting as opposed to putting together an installation, being able to roll it up. But what do you think that being in somewhere like, somewhere like it being in Europe and whether that has, uh, do you think whether that had a great impact on um, your painting practice, being in sort of... Yeah, yeah, and this painting in particular, um, because uh, I was looking at archives of Fiji and stuff in Cambridge as a part of my residency. I was, I went to Innova, to the Stuart Hall Library. I was looking at other kind of arts practices and particularly at, um, the history of black British art um, and film, because you can also take a film just on a hard drive. Yes, so. that is true. <laughs> <laughs> but, um, and whilst I was doing that and, and meeting artists and having conversations, actually a lot of my time back in the studio in London was um, uh, like and thinking about these things that I was seeing and, and these photographs and the fact that these people um, that I may or may not be related to uh, in these photographs um, were not around anymore but there was this kind of this image of them and clues to my heritage some things lost through like I guess colonial progress but those photos are still there which was I thought was kind of amazing and I guess drawing once again going back to drawing and sitting in the studio and paint, uh, painting and I mean the great thing about that residency is it's six months and you can sit in your studio for three days and you can you know uh, paint some things and throw things in the rubbish and you know you can work through stuff mm -hmm. and um, you know I was looking at not only archived material but also contemporary practices so I um, I got to see the work in of Lubaina Himmed, who is one of my favourite um, British painters, um, and in in the flesh, and it just kind of really when you when you're looking at them, there's two experiences I think you have, especially as an art student, is that you see things in the books here in Australia, and you I guess you get attached to artworks, and then when you go and you see the works in the gallery, it's a totally different experience. I think they're both important a bit different like mm. being there with the materiality of something the scale of it I just actually took me a while to kind of think about how I it was okay to like both things for different reasons if that makes yeah, sense. Yeah, yeah. yeah um and you when you were talking about accessing those collections of Fiji Air material and the photographs and things like that I mean what was that like to be on the other side of the world accessing you know your own kind of cultural heritage in this kind of quite sort of strange you know in this dis in that sort of disconnection did that sort of kind of enforce that those feelings of that that sort of diaspora experience and and i guess the whole experience like we're living in this little farmhouse in cambridge and then we're walking through what feels like could be an episode of vera or some kind of <laughs> like, you know, British crime drama series. Um, and I remember being on a train with a friend and saying, there's a body in that field. And they're like, there probably is, we just don't know how old it is. Um, yeah, and then to go in and look at the material and the material looks very different in um, situation. Like, cause you, it comes out, it gets unwrapped, you're wearing gloves, mm. you know, you fe feeling the weight of it. Uh, all that kind of stuff is really amazing. Mm. Um, and actually can't be experienced anywhere else other than in those collections mm. and at the Fiji Museum they don't have all the same things yeah. and, um, and and it's a real like treasure trove you do need a bit of guidance going through those things like you know 3,000 objects you can't see everything yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, but having like conversations with I think it's the conversations with people who know the collections as well and Pacific peoples who have gone to the collection so there's a real kind of like need to kind of connect with different people in the community over there over here mm. like it's really um it was a really amazing experience but yeah i mean it's now some of those objects are so old that um you know it's i guess a privilege to be able to 
mm. see them. A blessing and a cursing, so yeah, yeah. I get to go on a trip to London, <laughs> but also like, you know, um, all those objects are over there. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, you talked about this sort of previously, but talking about, you know, exploring cultural identity, you often place yourself and using your own body, whether it's in installations and, and um, live performance and, and photos. I mean, you sort of alluded to the half-life skulls in, in this painting, but is do you, do you see it as sort of like a self-portrait in any way? I do a, I do a bit, actually. Yeah. I feel like it's also a bit of a performance of my feelings, Yeah. in a way. Like, I'm, I think I mentioned before, it kind of got away from me and then I got it back again while yeah. making it. And, uh, it, yeah, so it really ended up being about my feelings and... I, yeah, I guess I do even see a painting as a performance in a way. Yeah, yeah, that's interesting. Um, because looking at some of your previous paintings, that, uh, whether they've been sort of the standalone paintings or paintings that you've incorporated into installations, you've used kind of more geometric shapes and, um, and you've sort of cut things, you know, you've cut those shapes out. And it's, um, do you think that, that perhaps your, there's been sort of like that kind of el uh, sort of evolution of your painting practice to be a little bit more sort of portraiture or more figurative or um, it may seem that way I think because what you see in a show is not like everything that's in your studio yeah. you know uh, it is um, a bit more um, figurative in than maybe the things I've done in the last four years. Mm -hmm. Um, but actually, uh, not those skull paintings really. Mm -hmm. It's just I think it's not. It's a bit more delicate than those other yeah. kind of more. Yeah. Um, you know, I spend a lot of time trying to make it look rough with less strokes, and this is actually um, actually has quite a bit of um, paint on it. Mm. Um, and I think actually that is to illustrate more what the issues were yeah. in making it, if that yeah. makes sense. Yeah. Um, so it does have a quality about it that, um, like maybe I would have stopped before now and started something new, but when I was making this one, I was quite feeling um, quite lost in things, yeah. so, yeah. yeah. Um, we could talk about um, the, your color palette. Um, in some of your previous work, you're, you've used the colours um, black, white and magenta, but in, in this painting you know, you've got the softer pink and the greens. Perhaps you could kind of talk about your, or the thoughts behind your choice of colour in, in, in your work. I think initially I had a really narrow palette because I was trying to kind of, uh, uh, because most of my works were photography and video self-portraiture, I was trying to look at a way of making a um, a version, an abstract version of myself uh, in the representation of these kind of geometrical shapes, myself and my family and my um, community. And uh, so I really kind of took from those mussy paintings that I'd, mussies that I originally had, they've got a limited palette, so I was doing that. But then actually when I went on my residency, I bought a few more colours. <laughs> <laughs> and you never look back. Yeah, once you start mixing a few things and uh, you just kind of get a bit caught in that. Like, right. um, and to get the fleshiness of something and then something that isn't that fleshy and kind of get those contrasts of things. Yeah. Yeah. So I just sort of, I think uh, that residency was very, uh, was a really great time for me to expand that colour palette. Yeah. yeah. Um, and we sort of talked about that's, you talked about the ge those geometric kind of shapes and how they are uh, in your previous works and how they might be sort of symbolic of family members. Do you want to maybe? Oh yeah, talk I guess about that? I guess the thing is like um, you know m like Masi designs are sort of a, a a language within themselves and actually a language that I don't understand that well. And so um, I think the things that I make are just as much about what I don't know as they are about what I have, I'm learning at the mm. time. And so I think those geometric shapes actually more relate to personal experiences of family dynamics. Okay, yeah. um, 
rather than like actually speaking to an older language that I don't speak. And um, in the painting, uh, for those who are watching at home, there's um, you've got this sort of adornment that's placed uh, above the head, which has um, been made out of is it tarpaulin? And, yeah, it's and a tarp and sulu, which is um, what sulu as a sarong is that the word? Yeah. Sarong. Yeah a wrong kind of material um, and it's like a rosette that I've made there and so it is like you know for me that discussion of different histories and like uh, you know uh, a rosette really just comes from like that colonial history and so yeah. Fiji and here and so um, uh, so for those who are questioning, I didn't know I was going to win. I didn't put my winners uh, yes. on there beforehand. <laughs> we did um, have a, we did have, um, I think it was our, I don't know, it was one of our kids' programs and one of the, we took them round and one of the little girls um, thought it was because Salotti had won. That was her little, um, <laughs> her little Rosetta ribbon. <laughs> so I thought that was kind of great. But I mean, um, you, you use different types of adornments in a lot of your work. I don't do, you? because I think actually, you know, the value of, of materials is uh, subjective to how much you need them and what you need them for. Mm. And so something like a tarp is invaluable in, actually can be invaluable in both kind of situations. In Fiji, it's used to complete a temporary room or cover something. In Australia, it's used to cover stuff, keep yeah. it, you know, keep your things safe um, but yeah so and it also has kind of replaced a traditional material that you would or uh, something natural that you would cover to protect something with so um, I made it out of that and initially when I was painting going to um, deciding about the painting it was going to be uh, on down lower and just sort of making the painting longer by um, being attached to the bottom but I started painting it quite um, low um, and then I uh, was going to add in, say, some hair. Uh, but then whilst I was painting it, I just sort of decided that I would complete the balance of the composition by placing it up higher. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, then its symbology also becomes even a little more symbolic. Yeah, yeah. Um, I think if some of you may, some of regular visitors who may have come to our new sacred show that we did with Parramatta Artist Studios back in 2018. Uh, Salotti uh, was in that exhibition and uh, she had um, an installation, a video installation up upstairs and as part of that you had um, quite a long kind of, uh, sort of a large adornment, adornment hanging from the ceiling and it was sort of um, well, just, hanging yeah, um, yeah, above it, yeah, yeah, yeah. And oh, yeah, so you, and you, like, yeah. Um, those kind of um, sort of like garland type. Yeah, um, kind of re um, super powered a, um, a lay that you get in a two dollar shop. I think like five or six went into this uh, with the same colour kind of palette that we were talking about, a limited colour palette. And so those kind of adornments, once again, about as much as I know and I don't, or as much as like seen as Pacific culture and what is and isn't, and how culture is always changing and moving. Mm. And so, you know, um, some things are put in there as a point to something else that has existed or as a fake yeah something fake fake pacific you yes, know yeah, yeah. um and yeah and so there was tarp in that and video and wood and corrugated iron so i do try to balance out materials mm. um between something that is maybe more traditionally seen as a art material and then some other material that speaks to you know it, like existence and living in the world and and you know using natural materials like shells and things like that as well yeah um, yeah yeah but also like thinking about where i get those materials from so like things that i put in adornment might be from an experience with people mm -hmm. so actually i when i'm making an adornment that that will relate to um uh our, our relationships or something that has taken part yeah. um and because i feel like if i necessarily like if i just grab anything i'm not i, I kind of need to feel something for that material mm -hmm. and it needs to kind of have a relationship to the idea somehow well i thought i might 
we might talk about sort of prizes now because it's sort of I guess prize season at the moment with the Archibald uh, and the other sort of art gallery New South Wales prizes that were announced last week. Oh and yeah, and the uh, Sullivan Prize winner Marikit Santiago was also in that show. Yes, yeah, yeah. at the same yeah. time. Um, yes, so yeah, Marikit had Marikit, sorry, not Marikit. <laughs> had uh, some paintings upstairs, so that was very exciting for us as well. Um, and lots of great winners in um, the Archibald and the, and the Win and the Sullivan this year, which is great. Um, and we've got Fisher's Ghosts and lots of other prizes coming up. So I guess I wanted to ask you all probably a, sort of a simple question, but what was what was going through your mind when you realised that you had won the $50,000? <laughs> well, it's interesting how much you think that you haven't won something, even though <laughs> only you and the other people who maybe won something are in the room <laughs> with a few others and uh, one by one the names get announced for different prizes and you're the only one who hasn't been announced but you can still tell yourself <laughs> oh I came here for nothing it's all, all <laughs> cruel, cruel <joke>. yeah. <laughs> um, yeah so you, it's sort of uh, of course it's amazing to win a prize and it definitely does a lot for your uh, practice and um, it's also like anyone in the room could win, you know, and so it's sort of, you just don't know. <laughs> yeah. So uh, what experience have you had with prizes? Have, do you enter many prizes or is um, it something that you... I do sometimes. Uh, I think a prize isn't just about winning, it's also about being in that show and the exposure of people seeing you in that show. But um, mm. I guess, um, I mean, you've won a prize, so you could help answer that. Are there many prize winners? <laughs> uh, yeah, I mean, because uh, some artists might, it can, I guess, be some type of distraction, I guess. Oh, uh, yeah. The, I, the I, process of entering and, and yeah. that sort of. I guess you enter not expecting to win. Mm. Um, maybe you enter hoping to get into the final. Um, it's sort of like grant writing, like you yeah. enter and you try for things. But it's almost like the lottery that you, even though you go to more effort than just buying a lottery ticket, once that you've entered something, you kind of have to forget about it because yeah. it may or may not come to yeah. fruition. Um, all right. Well, um, one last question. Mm, is this a harder one? Yeah. Like? No, oh, not really. <laughs> 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 What's in store for the future? Do you have any kind of exhibitions or anything that? Um, up that you, you can tell us about? <laughs> uh, um, what can I tell about? Uh, <laughs> I do have a few exhibitions, like a lot of other people I think um, we ha I had two years of exhibitions that are now squashed into one yes. year, so um, nothing that's been kind of announced yeah. yet, but yeah I do have a few um, exhibitions in other states, so hopefully the borders will open up soon. Yeah. Um, that, well, that brings me to COVID-19 and how that, what kind of sort of impact it had on your, I mean, you talked about your exhibition timelines and things being sort of compacted, mm -hmm. and, but how did it affect your, your sort of, your making, you know, that did it or, you know, was it better, was yeah, it yeah. worse, was it mm -hmm. the same? I guess it's that thing when you're making stuff, you've either got a good job and a studio and you can't do have any time to work in it, or you have not a great job and uh, you can't really, you're nervous because you can't necessarily afford to always work yeah. in the studio. And so I, I guess I was, like a lot of people, kind of slowed down. It was a bit difficult to think about making stuff for a while there, um, but that kind of, uh, balanced out a little bit with more time to work on like I don't know like other people I sort of when uh, my shows were cancelled for this not cancelled like moved into next year all of a sudden works that I was working on um, kind of had a different feeling and meaning and how do you kind of like continue making that same thing the same way and um, so it's been a bit of a um, slow down but I'm really lucky to have those shows so yeah. It's not actually a complaint as much as it is about re like you know this is a readjustment about how we live in the world. We can't like go back to the way things were before. So um, I guess I make things a bit slower at the moment would be yeah. the way to say that. Thank you. 
Now, does anyone else have a question for Bart Sardi? Um, John. Uh, yeah, well, uh, obviously, this is a painting prize, like the Mosman Art Prize, mm -hmm. and you're a multidisciplinary artist. Mm -hmm. I'm really interested in the question of, like, how relevant is paint to contemporary artists? You know, uh, mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah, um, well, the, you know how there's always that, uh, there used to always be that discussion about painting being dead? Painting is dead. Yeah, yeah. it's <laughs> obviously really great at resurrecting it, it never actually dies and you know it's uh, I mean I use it as a medium so I'm I think it's very relevant there's a lot of um, how to answer that question yeah. it's like saying that about anything yeah. like um, the great thing about being an artist is you get to make stuff you get to make ideas into represented somehow and um, I mean painting it, you know there's a lot of people who only paint and you, of course, it's such an amazing medium. Um, you know, you could, you could be almost painting the same picture for the rest of your life, and there'd be so much for you to do in that, mm. like in the reiteration of that that picture. You know, it's. Um, I think it's got such a like uh, intense history. It's kind of amazing to see, like even just looking around in this show and the different styles and subject matter and way people have made um, paintings you kind of go oh it's always going to be something to yeah. consider is that is that kind of answering your what a difficult question to ask <laughs> as well <laughs> it's so intense <laughs> <laughs> uh, does anyone else have a question okay well thank you everyone and um Thank you very much, Slotty. That's been great. Um, thank you very much for coming out. Um, the exhibition closes tomorrow at three o'clock, um, but we're open until four today. So for those who haven't had a chance, proper chance to have a look, please come and do so. And you can also still vote for the Viewer's Choice Award, um, and that will be announced early next week. So. Um, please go do that um, and but yeah thank you very much for, for coming today and for those who are watching on Facebook um, that is great thank you very much